Jose Gomez, uh, I don't know if uh, David uh, mentioned all this this morning, but I was given the task of introducing Jose this afternoon because other than Jose, I'm the only one who knows how to pronounce his hometown. <laughs> Oh, is the first time? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I was trying to instruct you, but it's a slow process. <laughs> and I was unsuccessful. So, <laughs> But he was born in San Luis Potosí in Mexico. <laughs> he made the gospel age 15. And, and um, well, exactly when did you come to the U.S.? 20 years ago. So that makes uh, you're about 20 years old then? 23? Well, anyway. Came at a young age, and of course, if you uh, listen to him speak, and you have, he, he, he speaks a lot better than I do. Pero soy un tajano, so. <laughs> Any migrated legally to the U.S. in 2003. Of course, he said it's 17. And you didn't understand English at the time, did you? Didn't understand. So, so why can't we understand Spanish? I don't know why that is. Because <laughs> we're not 17, that's why. <laughs> in 2010, he graduated with an associate degree in mechanical engineering technology from Lone Star College. And he currently works as a mechanical designer. And he preaches for the uh, Spanish Church of Christ in Spring, which, of course, meets at this facility also. And that uh, congregation originally established in uh, 2012 uh, with a few members of his family in Porter, Texas. Uh, since then, Jose has preached in gospel meetings and lectureships around Texas and, and Mexico. He has no formal education from a school or preaching and that uh, reminds me of someone else I know. But he's been blessed to have uh, met faithful men in the gospel who have served as his mentors. And he has two daughters, Alexis, age 11, and Evelyn, uh, age 9. So we're very pleased to have him. He's going to be speaking on the eternal home of the church. So, uh, Jose, come speak to us. Well, you know, it is always a blessing to be attending this lectureship. I think always the topics that are selected to be presented are always topics that uh, help me in my spiritual life. And again, I am thankful to David, uh, John, and Ken for uh, the trust that they have placed in me for a third consecutive time now to be part of this lectureship. And uh, as I was thinking about this uh, topic that I was given, uh, it made me think of Second Peter chapter three and verse sixteen, where he talks about uh, about those things that are hard or difficult to be understood. And um, I don't know what I did to David. I thought we were good friends, we were in good terms, but in my opinion, I think he gave me the hardest topic to to deal with. Not only uh, because uh, the Bible right talks about heaven, uh, especially when it talks about the church in heaven in a symbolical or a symbolic uh, way. So he made me pull out a bunch of different books and commentaries and lexicons so that I could get familiar with a lot of the terms that I'm going to be dealing with this afternoon. And uh, again, I'm also thankful to the congregation here in spring, uh, the Spanish congregations. We have been very blessed to be uh, part of uh, or working together with the congregation here uh, in spring. And just before we get started on the, on the topic that we're going to be discussing this afternoon, the eternal home of the church, I want to think about three biblical principles before we get started. The first one being what we read about in Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, and only those which are revealed belong to us. But the second principle that I want to keep in mind before we continue is also that uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, we read that we must learn not to think above that which is written. And finally, the third principle that I want to keep in mind 
First uh, Peter chapter four and verse eleven: If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. With this in mind, I would like to begin uh, discussing the topic that has been assigned to me: the eternal home of the church. And when I think about this topic, there is three questions that come to my mind. The first one is the obvious question: Where is the home of the church? But then we are curious and we want to know more. And another question that comes to my mind is, what does the home, the home of the church look like? And then the third question that comes to my mind is, what will life be like in the eternal home of the church? And the reason why I cited those three principles before getting started is because through the scriptures I can answer the question to two of them, but one of them I cannot answer. The first question is, or the first uh, point that we're going to be dealing with this morning, where is the eternal home of the church? And when I think about this first point, where is the eternal home of the church, there's only three places that I can think of. Right now, as human beings living in this tabernacle, we are living on earth. And as we are familiar with the doctrines of the denominational world, we know that there is a teaching that they uh, spread erroneously about a renovated earth and Christians living in a renovated earth. But we know through the scriptures that that cannot be the case. So the first possible option, of course, would be uh, here on earth, being the eternal home of the, of the church. But we know because of Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Now there is a couple of uh, words here that are important or expressions in this verse that we just read. First, when, the, when Peter is talking about the heavens that will pass away or cease to exist, he is making reference to the vault expanse of the sky with all things visible in it, but also he is making reference to the entire universe. But then the second thing that he mentions in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10 is that the elements will melt or shall be dissolved. When he talks about the elements, the Greek word or the definition that I find is that this is making reference to the elements of all things um, uh, have, have come to, to, to begin or to exist, is referring to the material cause of the universe and also to the smallest particles that make up the universe, being, in that case, the atoms and the cells that make up the, the universe. And so in this case, what we see uh, beginning with, with this lesson is that the earth cannot be uh, the eternal home of the, of the church because the Bible clearly tells us that the, that the earth will be completely destroyed and that will take place on the judgment day. But then there is a second option. And we know that when we die, when we leave this world, it is the body that dies that goes back to the grave. And we know that our soul goes to a place called Hades, which is divided in two different places. We know that there is a division, there is a higher place, which is paradise or the bosom or Abraham's, uh, Abraham's bosom. And we know that there is also a place of torment. So the second possible place for the um, home of the church could be paradise in Hades. But we know through the scriptures again that that is not the case because we read in John chapter 5 verse 28 and 29, our Lord Jesus saying, do not marvel at this for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So we know that all the souls that are in Hades will come out of Hades, go back to the bodies will, which, which will be transformed. Some will be resurrected to eternal life and some will be resurrected to eternal damnation. But also in reading uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 13 and 14, we are told that after or on the judgment day, after death and Hades, the liver, the dead that were in them, they themselves will be thrown into the lake of fire. That is the second uh, death. So we know again that not only is the earth going to be destroyed on Judgment Day, therefore it cannot be the home of the church. We know that Hades itself will be thrown into the, the lake of fire, so therefore it cannot be the eternal home of the church. So that leaves only one third possible option, and that is heaven, which is exactly what Christ said to his disciples when we read in John chapter 14, verse 1 through 3, 
And he says, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may also be. There ye may be also. So one of the things that Jesus is saying is that he is going back to heaven. He's going to go back to the Father. And when he goes to heaven, he will go and prepare a place, a mansion for every Christian. And what we know about Christ, this morning, um, one of the speakers was citing uh, John chapter 1 and verse 1, speaking of the Christ as in the beginning, being the, uh, the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we also know that Jesus came from heaven, for he declared that himself in John chapter 3 and verse 13, when he said that no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven, uh, speaking of himself being that, that the, him who descended from heaven. Now, we, as we read the scriptures also, we read uh, verses like John chapter 16 and Acts chapter 2 and verse 33, where we are told that after his ministry, after he came down from heaven, coming down to earth, he fulfilled the ministry which was given to him, and after that, he went back to heaven. And we know also uh, when we read Acts chapter uh, 7 and verse 56, 6, 56 when he talks about uh, Stephen, that he is about to die, and he sees the heavens open, and he sees the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of God. So, again, looking at the scriptures, we see that since Christ came from heaven, came down to earth, fulfilled his ministry, he died on the cross for us, went down to Hades, he resurrected and went back to heaven where he is preparing a home for the church, it follows then that the, that the only place or that the place where the home of the church will be, will be in heaven. But then that brings us to the next question. And also before I go a little bit more into it, uh, we need to remember, we need to note as well that this hope that we have of heaven is not something that is just particular just to us in the Christian dispensation. When we read Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 through 10, it talks about Abraham, talks about Jacob, about Isaac, and about Sarah. And what we're told is uh, the following. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So we know through the scriptures that also since the patriarchal times, uh, Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, and Sarah also were sharing the same hope that we now have, we, that we now have which is to have our home, our eternal home in heaven. As we continue reading in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13 through 16, it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. We assured, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind the country from which they had come out, they would have had the opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And then also as Christians, we are reminded by the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, that our citizenship is in heaven. And also the apostle, uh, the apostle Peter in First Peter chapter one and verse uh, three and following, he talks to us about uh, blessed being God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of uh, Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance corruptible incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you so again when we look at the scriptures and we answer this first question where is the home of the of the church we 
again, we learn through the scriptures that the home of the church is in heaven. But this will bring us to the next question. And this is the question that I cannot find an answer. What does heaven look like? Can we have an image, a picture of exactly what heaven will look like? Uh, earlier today, after uh, Bruce was preaching on, on his lesson, I uh, noticed that David and him were talking about two different uh, points of views uh, that come or in the brotherhood about the church, whether because there is no uh, recollection or a registry of the church existing right for certain centuries and that it cannot, proven, cannot be proven that there are two views as far as that. But another passage that I found in relation to, to this is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verse 2 and following. And I will just um, quote a little bit of what it says there. Uh, it talks about the Apostle Paul uh, talking about uh, being caught up to the third heaven. And it says as well that he was taken to paradise where he heard things that uh, are not able to, to be said or to be uttered. But also he said that it was unlawful for man to speak of those things. Now, there's two different views on that chapter, one being that because the word paradise appears and that verse is making reference to paradise in Hades, but the other view is also that it talks to, because it says the third heaven is talking, to, is talking about heaven where God the Father or where our God is. Uh, personally, I incline more towards the latter, and the reason why is because every time I read in the Bible about talking about Hades, it always talks about down to Hades or Hades below. But, every but in this occasion, or when it talks about heaven, it talks about up or above. Now, that, that's not really the important part, whether it was paradise in Hades or paradise in heaven. But the important thing is what was told to Paul, that even though it was given to Paul to see those things, to, be, to, to have the, the blessing of being caught up to the third heaven, to hear those unspeakable things, what we learn here is that he is told by God that he does not have permission to speak of those things. That's one of the reasons why I cited as one of the first principles early on our lesson, Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29, because it talks about those things which are secret, which belong only to God. And in that realm is also, we know that there is going to be a resurrection. The Bible tells us that our bodies will be transformed. And that's all the Bible tells us, but it does not tell, the Bible does not uh, reveal exactly how the, those bodies will look like. And again, when we talk about heaven, the reason why we cannot describe how the home of the, the church looks like is because God has chosen not to reveal exactly how heaven will look like. And I think in part of the reason, not only because God has chosen not to reveal heaven, but in part of the reason as well is because, again, we live in a material world and trying to explain in material words a spiritual realm is impossible. But again, this takes us now to the third question, which is, what will heaven or what will life uh, be? Like, what will life be like for the church in heaven? And for this, we actually have some information. But even the information that we are given is information that is in symbols that it mostly talks to us about the quality of life of the church in heaven rather than explaining to us exactly how the church will look like in heaven. It's mostly about the quality of life, the new state of the church or the redeemed church or the glorified church in heaven. And so in order for us to talk about or answer this third question, what will life be like for the church in the eternal home, we have to turn to the chapter 21 and the, and the first part of chapter 22 of the book of Revelation. Now, if you go with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 21, uh, verse 1 and 2, it reads as follows. Again, the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 1 and 2. Now, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 
Now, when we read this phrase that John sees a new heaven and a new earth because the first heaven and the first earth and the sea had passed away, it's not really talking about something that has been made new, but rather it is talking about the state of the church and the glorified, again, the glorified state of the church once the church has been resurrected, once the members of the church have been resurrected and being taken by God to heaven. Now, in order to understand this a little bit better, there's two verses that come to mind. The first one being Matthew chapter 25 and verse 34. You remember that Christ, when he's talking about that day, when uh, the, the judgment day, he talks about those that will be on his right and those that will be on his left. And then on verse 34, he says, talking to the ones on his right, Come you, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom, prepare for you from the foundation of the world. So the first thing that we learn about the church uh, in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 1 and 2, is that the church will enter heaven in a glorified state. And in order to understand this a little bit more, we have to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 39 through 49, where the Apostle Paul is talking about the resurrection. And there are some things that are important because the Apostle Paul, in speaking about the resurrection, he's speaking about the state of the Christian or the church here on earth versus the state of the church or the Christian in heaven. And again, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 39 says, all flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies, bodies, terrestrial bodies, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star dif differs from another star in glory, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, and it is raised in power. It is sown in natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. And afterward, the spiritual, the first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is, from, is, is, is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are also those who are made of dust. And as is the, man, the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. So the first thing that we learn about the quality of life of the church and the new state in heaven is we learn that after the resurrection, the bodies have been transformed. And again, we know that that resurrection, we are only told that the bodies will be transformed. John gives us a little bit more information in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2 when he tells us that now we are children of God, but we do not know or it has not been revealed yet what we shall be, but one thing we know. And he says that what we know is that when Christ is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see Christ as he is. So the first thing that we learn about the glorified state of the church is that it is the glorified state after the resurrection and one of the things that we learn about the, the glorified state of the, of the church, again, is that uh, here it is being described as the holy city, the new Jerusalem, prepared for her husband. But the second thing we learn in the book of Revelation about the church or the state of the church in heaven or what life will be like for the church in heaven is that the church has a bigger blessing. And, and it is that we will see God face to face and enjoy full fellowship with God. We read in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 3, and it says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will, with, will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. When I thought about this uh, uh, specific verse, it made me think back to people like Moses. 
One of the things that Moses requested of God is that he wanted to see the glory of God. And remember, God, uh, when he takes him up to the mountain, he said that he would cover him because it was not possible for him to see the face of God. He says, for there is no man that can see God and live. So we think about the greatest servants of God, both in the Old and the New Testament, and what we see is that none of them was ever able to see the face of God. But in the glorious state of the church, being in heaven, one of the, great, one of the big blessings that we have is that now we can see God face to face. We can contemplate the glory of God. And that's only because through the, of, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have been transformed to that state where we can enjoy not only the fellowship with God, there in the realm or in the house of God, but also we can enjoy, again, like I said, seeing the glory of God. But another thing that we learn about this, uh, or the third blessing that we find about the quality of life uh, of the church in heaven, is that in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4, it says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, nor crying, there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. One of the things that we learn about uh, this verse is that there will never again be a reason for the church to cry over losing a loved one, because there will be no more death in heaven. Another thing that we learn from this is that we'll, there will never again be a reason for the church to cry because of going through different trials and tribulations and the difficulties that we find in this world. And part of the reason for that is because what we read in verse 1, that the first heaven, the first earth, the first things were done away, and God is making everything new. That's the new state where there is no, no death, there is no sorrow. And one of the things that I uh, can bring to my mind when I think of sorrow, the things that cause pain in our, in our lives daily, it's, again, the difficult times that we have in this world, facing tribulations when we fail God because uh, we are given into temptation. And those are things that cause pain in the Christian. But what we see is that all those things have, be t have been taken away, and now the Christian can enjoy a life in heaven. The church can enjoy a life in heaven where there is no more pain. And part of the reason as well for that. If we think of the reason for pain and suffering here in this world, uh, the Apostle Paul, after finishing his first missionary trip, he goes back to the congregations that him and Barnabas um, uh, set up in the first missionary trip. And one of the things that he tells them when he uh, confirms their faith, he tells them that it was necessary for them to face a lot of trials and tribulation before entering the kingdom of heaven. Now, also when we read in the first letter of the Apostle Peter, in, the cha in chapter 2, he talks about the sufferings. I'm sorry, chapter 1, he talks about the faith of the Christian. And he says that even though the faith of the Christian is as pure or even purer than gold or more beautiful than gold, just like gold has, has to go through a process to be transformed into that beautiful mineral that we know, he says also your faith has to be tried. So we know that in this world, pain and suffering is necessary because that, part, that is part of the probatory um, state of the church here on earth to, get, to be ready or to be prepared for heaven. So with that already fulfilling the, 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 the purpose of the pain and suffering, the church now being in heaven, there is no longer need for pain and suffering. And so God does away with all pain and suffering, any source that causes pain and suffering for the church. But another thing that we see about the church or the life of the church in heaven is that no faithful member of the church will be left out. And now here I'm not going to follow with the next uh, verses in Revelation chapter 21, but I will jump all the way to chapter 21, verse 24 and 26, through 26. And it says, And all the nations of those who are saved shall walk in the light, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there, and they shall bring glory and honor of the nations into it. One of the things that God promised to Abraham 
uh, in the book of Genesis, chapter 12, uh, verse 1 through verse 3. He said that he would make out of him a great nation, that he would give him the promised land, the land of Canaan. But also God said that uh, in him or in his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Now, when Jesus comes and he begins his ministry, and after he dies for the church and he resurrects and he gives the great commission, he tells the apostles that they are to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature into every nation of the world. And what we see in the state of heaven, it says that we see the nations of those who were saved shall walk in the light, meaning that every single faithful Christian from the beginning of the church will be there present in heaven, and none of them will be uh, left out. But then another thing that we see is that every blessing that was lost in the Garden of Eden will be restored to an even greater degree. We read in the chapter, uh, 22nd chapter of the book of Revelation, uh, verse 1 through 5, and it says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its trees and on either side of, of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each year yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no night there. They need no lamp, nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Another thing, uh, we see a few things in, in these five verses. Number one, we see the pure river coming out of the throne of God. And in that way, we see every single blessing imaginable and unimaginable that God can bestow on the Christian. Not only the peace, not only the safety that we see of the church in heaven, but another thing that we see is that it mentions the tree, the tree of life, uh, the tree of eternal life. Uh, again, when the, the first time that we see that tree of life is in the Garden of Eden. And after man uh, sinned against the commandment of God, man lost that ability or lost that blessing of having access to the tree of life. But here again, when we see the state of the church in heaven, now we see that the church gains access to the tree of life again, meaning having the eternal life living in heaven uh, forever. But another beautiful blessing that I see uh, in verse 3, chapter 22 and verse 3, it says that there shall be no more curse. When we think about the reason why uh, man was cursed to begin with, it was because of sin. We see that in the Garden of Eden, the serpent comes, Satan comes, and he tempts uh, man, tempt, he tempts uh, Eve, and we see that man gave into temptation, and because of it, man lost access to all the blessings that he had in the beginning from God. But what this verse uh, tells us, that there shall be no more curse, it means that there is no possible way for the church to fall again. That means that the church, once it gets to that state in heaven, once that the church gets to, 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 his home and to her home in heaven, there is no way that any Christian will ever fall again. And when we think about our Christian life, all this morning we've been talking about being faithful, staying in the church, because we can only be saved in the church. I mean, even as Christians, we know that we can be faithful, we know that every day we can wake up and start our day with a prayer and ask God to help us through the day so that we do not fall uh, prey to temptation, so that we do not give in to the trials and the sorrows of this world and lose our desire to continue to serve God. And it is a possibility that even if we are members of the church and we are faithful, there's still a possibility that we could sin. That is why the Apostle John in first. In his first letter, uh, chapter 2 and verse 1, he said that those things he was writing so that we would not sin. And again, that, that is one of the possibilities that we have here on earth. But one of the big blessings that we have of the church living in heaven is that that possibility is taken away. The church can no longer, no member of the church can again fall into sin because everything that could drive a Christian into sinning against God has been taken away. There is no devil anymore that can tempt man. 
There is no sorrows in life. There is no temptations in the world because the material world has been completely destroyed. So again, the big blessing here is that once we make it to heaven and once we are in that glorified state as the church, we will remain there forever. And there is no danger. But there's other symbols that the Bible talks about here. It talks about, for instance, about uh, the Great Wall. And we know that the church will be protected uh, by God. We know, again, that the Bible here in this, uh, both of these chapters, it talks about darkness and it talks about light, that there is no darkness, and that even those gates would never be closed, meaning, again, if we go back to the way that the cities were built in the Old Testament and uh, even through history, they would surround the cities with the great wall and close the gates at night to protect the inhabitants of that city from any danger that came from outside. But in heaven, we see that because God has destroyed everything that could potentially affect or um, have an impact, a negative impact on the church, God has taken everything away. Those gates are always open because the church is completely safe once it makes it to the state, to that state in heaven. And I want to finish uh, this lesson by uh, reading uh, chapter 21 of the book of Revelation, verses 5 uh, through 7. It says as follows. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son." The reason why I wanted to finish this lesson by reading this, um, this part of the scripture is because you read what verse six, uh, verse 6 says. It says, and he said to me, it is done. So one of the certainties that we have as Christians is that any promise that God makes, he will always fulfill. And when he talks about the eternal uh, glorified state of the church in heaven, he's speaking of it when he talks to John as something that has already taken place. And God is saying that these things are certain, and God is saying that those things are true, and that we can have all the certainty that if God has promised that this will be the state of the church in heaven, we can have all the confidence in the world to take God at his word and believe that his promise will be fulfilled. And again, if we go back to through the Bible, we see that every, every time that God made a promise, he always fulfilled it. We, especially when we read the, the end of the book of Joshua, we see when Joshua comes before the people of Israel, and he tells them that all the promises that God had made to them, God had fulfilled on that day, and not one promise was left um, undone by God. So again, one of the big blessings that we have as Christians is that we may have the confidence that God will fulfill all the promises that he has made to us. So again, what we have learned this afternoon is that when we talk about the eternal home of the church, we can only answer two questions out of the three that we had. Number one, we know that the eternal home of the church will be in heaven. And number two, we know that life in heaven for the church the church will be able to enter heaven in a glorified state. That is because of the resurrection. We have learned that the church will see God face to face, something that had never been done by any man before. Number three, we've seen that the church will live a life free from all sorrow and suffering because God has taken all those things away. Number four, we've seen that no faithful member of the church will be left out. And number five, we've seen that every blessing that was lost in the Garden of Eden will be restored to an even higher degree. This afternoon, uh, my hope is that every lesson that has been presented uh, today about the church, we have learned everything. Number one, we have learned that if we, if we remain faithful in the church, we have that, that promise that one day we will be in eternity with God in heaven. And as we have studied all of the lessons this morning on uh, studies about the church, I think it should put in our perspective how important the church really is. God, from the beginning, had the plan of the church. God did everything for the church to be a reality. And not only that, but if we remain in the church, we can have all certainty that as long as we remain faithful members of the church, 
we will end in that glorified state as members of that church. But again, uh, this morning, if we have, or this afternoon, I'm sorry, if we have somebody who is not yet a member of the body of Christ, we extend an invitation to you to obey the gospel, to be part of this uh, church that has the promise of God that one day will enter that inheritance in heaven and remain with God for eternity. But again, if you're a member of the church and you have fallen away and you need to get right with God, today, today is the day to do that. Thank you for your time.